Okay. So we're just going to proceed if that's okay. If anyone needs to go out, get, get some coffee, feel free. Everything is in your slides, so you're, you're not going to miss anything. So in, in this next session, we're actually going to do GI infections. We're going to do skin, soft tissue, bone, and joint infections. And then some, some esoteric stuff, which, uh, which is always important on the board exam. Fungal infections and, and then selected parasites, which you are very likely to see. All right, so the first case is a healthy two-year-old boy who develops watery diarrhea for several days and is found to have salmonella enteritidis in his stool. He attends childcare. There's no history of travel. And we want to know what the most likely route of acquisition of this infection. Is it through household contact, ingestion of contaminated food, childcare contact, contact with an infected swimming pool, or contact with an infected pet kitten? Good, okay, so contaminated food. So let's talk a little bit about salmonella. So remember, there is non-typhoidal salmonella and typhoidal salmonella. So we're gonna spend a couple minutes talking about each of these. So transmission of non-typhoidal salmonella is usually through the ingestion of contaminated foods, milk and water, poultry, eggs, dairy product, fruits, vegetables, peanut butter, just about any, any type of food has, has, has been implicated in the transmission of salmonella. This infection, you really need a lot of organisms to cause symptomatic disease, 10 to the fifth to 10 to the sixth. So this does not tend to be transmitted easily among, uh, from person to person and is much more likely to be transmitted from contaminated food. The incubation period is relatively short and this along with Campylobacter are the most common causes of foodborne outbreaks of gastroenteritis. You also have to remember importantly that pet lizards, pet turtles, iguanas, snakes, alligators, you'd be amazed what pets people have today, but, but any lizard uh, certainly can transmit salmonella and that is probably the most common mode of transmission to young infants is, is with pet lizards. Again, person-to-person -person spread with salmonella is much less common, again, because you really need a large volume of organisms to cause symptomatic infection. So this is not a common cause of childcare outbreaks. Household transmission does occur, but it's still not as common as, let's say, with Shigella, which, which we'll talk about. So the manifestations are the children can be totally asymptomatic, Acute gastroenteritis and enterocolitis are the most common things that we see. These kids usually present with abdominal pain. They usually have a non-bloody diarrhea, but, uh, but, but it can be bloody as well, and they may or may not have fever. The, these are usually self-limited. They usually res resolve within a week, and most of these serotypes do not invade, but uh, you, you can have bloody diarrhea. Salmonella bacteremia, fortunately, is rare, but when we do see it, it's almost exclusively in young infants, usually the first month of life, and they can also have meningitis. That's really the only time that we see salmonella bacteremia and meningitis is in young infants. Remember, sicklers can have osteomyelitis from salmonella, and in these cases, GI symptoms may not be present. Salmonella is known to to also cause an asymptomatic chronic carrier state where, where they can excrete the organism for a prolonged period of time after infection. And certainly if you treat these kids with antibiotics, they will continue to excrete the organism for an even longer period of time. Carriage does not mean that they are contagious and we generally do not exclude the kids from school or daycare. Salmonella typhi is a different bird. Uh, it is found only in uh, humans. Uh, and when you find Salmonella typhi, it means that they've, uh, it's, it's been transmitted usually from an infected person or a contaminated item. This is common in many, many parts of the world, and in this country it's usually acquired during in international travel, and this is the cause of typhoid or also called enteric fever. Uh, 
This can certainly cause a protracted bacteremic illness, usually with a gradual onset. They usually present with high fever, constitutional symptoms, and they may have significant abdominal pain, hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy. The, they are usually described as uh, having a relative bradycardia and a, uh, a rash, which is known as rose spots as well. But in young infants, these kids usually present with nonspecific febrile illness. Fever plus a travel history should always make you think of typhoid fever. So question two is a two-year-old previously healthy boy who presents with a two-day history of low-grade fever, abdominal cramps, and profuse watery diarrhea. The stool culture grows, again, salmonella and enteritidis, just like the first case. What's the most appropriate intervention for this child? Supportive care, one dose of ceftriaxone, amoxicillin for 10 days orally, azithromycin orally for five days, or Bactrim for 10 days. So this is salmonella ant antiridotus, non-typhoidal salmonella. How do we deal with that in a healthy two-year-old? Good, so supportive care. So who needs to be treated with antibiotics? So certainly gastroenteritis in patients who are at high risk for invasive disease. And how do we define that? Certainly infants less than three months because they can get bacteremia and meningitis. We like to treat them with antibiotics. Immunocompromised patients, including HIV patients, anyone with, with a malignancy or has undergone a transplant, hemoglobinopathy such as sickle cell, and anyone with significant GI dysfunction, we like to treat them with antibiotics. Everyone else, we do not treat with antibiotics if they just have gastroenteritis. Certainly bacteremic children, kids with meningitis, osteomyelitis, enteric fever, we always want to treat with antibiotics because of the complications, and then also chronic carriers of salmonella typhi because they can have a high recurrence rate. What antibiotic we choose really depends on susceptibility patterns. If they're sick enough to be admitted to the hospital, we usually start with cefotaxime or ceftriaxone, and then uh, depending on, on the uh, susceptibilities, we may change that. So infection control and prevention measures for, for salmonella. So infected child care center attendees can be readmitted to the child care center when they are asymptomatic. You do not have to have a negative stool culture after a salmonella infection because, again, they may excrete the organism for months. So you do not need follow-up stool cultures in these kids. Once they are asymptomatic, they can go back to school and daycare. And you do not need to test contacts unless they are symptomatic. Okay? So this is very different from what we do with Shigella, which we're going to talk about. All right, so I kind of given it away here. A three-year-old girl who has crampy abdominal pain and profuse mucus diarrhea for two days is hospitalized for dehydration. She develops a brief generalized seizure. What's the agent most likely causing this child's gastroenteritis? Uh, and I've already given you the answer here. This is a classic history for Shigella. So gastroenteritis, bloody diarrhea, and seizures, that should equal Shigella in your mind. So, Shigella, unlike Salmonella, person-to-person -person transmission is very common and is the most common mode of transmission. Again, unlike Salmonella, you need very few organisms to cause disease. Therefore, this is very contagious and easily transmitted from person to person. This is very important in child care center outbreaks. It is not as common in young infants as Salmonella. These kids do not usually have chronic carrier states. So once you treat these, uh, they usually do not continue to carry them. And in this country, Shigella sonai is the most common. These kids usually present with high fever, crampy abdominal pain. They usually start with watery diarrhea, which quickly becomes bloody and mucousy. About 50% of these children have bloody stools uh, with polys. And without treatment, these, these kids can be symptomatic for one to two weeks. The extra, in, in the, the extra intestinal manifestations are very common with these kids. The most common one to remember, again, is seizures. Uh, 
Uh, these are generalized, self-limited seizures, and they may actually develop before the diarrhea. Shigella has also been implicated in some cases of hemolytic uremic syndrome. Ileus and megacolon have been described. Septicemia, bacteremia is very rare, much less common than with salmonella. And as Dr. Zeft talked about this morning, reactive arthritis, this is one of the common causes of reactive arthritis and Reiter's syndrome. So antimicrobial therapy, we, we, generally, um, we generally treat kids who have severe symptoms, who have dysentery, and who have underlying states. Uh, therapy does shorten the duration of diarrhea and stops shedding of the organism within one or two days. We usually like to use azithromycin for treatment. IV ceftriaxone is an alternative. Remember the oral cephalosporins, which we used to use, things like cefixime and omnicef, are not effective against Shigella. And now there's pretty widespread resistance to ampicillin and Bactrim. The quinolones are also effective, but resistance is quickly developing, and we usually treat for five days. So sometimes we see kids who we know have Shigella, but have already improved, are not having bloody diarrhea, and are really well, you do not need to treat those kids with antibiotics. But if they're still symptomatic, we generally like to treat them. And for purposes of the boards, you want to treat kids with Shigella. Infection control measures are, again, different. So if, if you have an infected child who is attending daycare, you need to treat them, and they need to be excluded from the center until they are asymptomatic and until they have had two negative stool cultures. So you really want to document clearance of the infection because this is transmittable. And then what we do with, with uh, symptomatic contacts is we culture them, we treat them if they're positive, and then again, we exclude them from the center until they're asymptomatic and until they've had two negative stool cultures. Okay, so a five-year-old develops severe bloody diarrhea after attending a county fair. Over the next day, she's noted to be pale and to have decreased urine output. And uh, her labs show a hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and renal failure. What's the agent most likely to be related to her illness? Campylobacter, Entamoeba histolytica, ETEC, STEC, or Giardia? Okay, so this is hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, which is most closely associated with E. coli O157. So it is, uh, it is now called Shiga toxin producing E. coli, STEC, formerly used to be called enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Uh, and O15787 is the prototype, al although this is not the only strain that causes hemolytic uremic syndrome. This produces a shiga-like toxin, which is invasive and causes bloody diarrhea. And the most common mode of transmission, this is usually foodborne, uh, but person-to-person -person spread also has been documented. And the main culprits are usually undercooked beef, uh, unpasteurized milk, apple cider, water, food sources. These are common in outbreaks at county fairs. Certainly contact direct with animals and their environment also are very much implicated as well as person to person. Uh, about five to 10% of infected children will go on to develop hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uh, antimicrobial therapy is not effective against this organism and actually there are data that says that we may increase the risk of HUS if you treat these children. So if you suspect somebody has, has E. coli O15787, we do not treat them with antibiotics. And like with Shigella, because this can be transmitted from person to person, these children need to be excluded from childcare until they're asymptomatic and they've had two negative stool cultures. So Shigella and E. coli, you have to document negative stool cultures before you let them back into daycare. So ETEC, which is enterotoxigenic E. coli, 
you need to remember this bug because it's the most common cause of traveler's diarrhea. So somebody who's traveled and comes back and, and has a watery diarrhea and maybe some crampy abdominal pain is, is most likely to have this organism. It's usually is self-limited. Usually don't treat this with antibiotics. Uh, these are other types of E. coli that cause diarrhea. It's very unlikely that they're going to ask you about these, so I'm going to skip it. So a five-year-old boy develops fever, crampy abdominal pain, and bloody diarrhea. The day previous to the onset, he attended a picnic where he ingested undercooked chicken. You suspect infection with Campylobacter jejuni. Which of the following is a true statement concerning this organism? Guillain-Barre is a complication. Person-to-person -person spread is most common mode of transmission. Transmission in childcare settings is common. School-age children have the highest incidence of infection or bacteremia is a common complication. Very good, so Guillain-Barre is a complication. So Campylobacter jejuni, major cause of diarrhea, um, and it is usually acquired through ingestion of contaminated foods and water. So very much like salmonella, young chickens, dairy products, meat, water, short incubation period. This is very much like salmonella in that infants and toddlers have the highest incidence of infection, and it can cause a wide variety of manifestations from mild symptoms to severe blood or, bloody mucousy diarrhea. Bacteremia, however, is very rare with Campylobacter jejuni. There is an organism called Campylobacter fetus, which is associated with neonatal bacteremia and meningitis. That is more likely to show up on the PEDS ID boards rather than the general PEDS board, but I just put it there just in case. But what you do need to remember is that Guillain-Barre, this is the most common cause of Guillain-Barre, uh, which usually occurs six to 20 days after Campylobacter jejuni enteritis. This organism has also been associated with reactive arthritis, and Reiter's syndrome, in HLA B27 positive patients. As far as antimicrobial therapy, it may shorten the duration of the illness and prevent relapses, but it needs to be given early in the course. Uh, and we usually treat these kids with erythromycin and azithromycin. Uh, you know, again, a lot of times we find out somebody has Campylobacter and they're already asymptomatic, in, and in those cases we usually don't treat. So a 12-year-old boy develops right lower quadrant abdominal pain, fever, and leukocytosis. His mother reports that he ingested chitlins four days prior to the onset of his symptoms. He's febrile to 38.9 and has focal tenderness in the right lower quadrant. What's the most likely cause of this patient's illness? Is it Vibrio, Giardia, Entamoeba histolytica, Yersinia, or Eremonis? So as you, you can see with these cases of gastroenteritis, they all present with diarrhea and abdominal pain. So if they want you to pick a bug, they've got to tell you something about risk factors. So what they ate, where they've been, where they've traveled to are all very important. So here there's a clear association betwe between right lower quadrant abdominal pain, chitlins, and Yersinia, okay? So Yersinia also is a common cause of a diarrhea. Water, food, and animals are the primary reservoirs. Again, uh, pork intestines, soybeans, dairy products all have been associated with Yersinia. The wide spectrum of severity of clinical illness this is the organism that tends to classically mimic appendicitis, okay? So right lower quadrant tenderness, you think for all the world this is appendicitis, and then they actually have a positive stool culture for Yersinia. This is also an important cause of reactive arthritis, and it has been associated with erythema nodosum as well. The other thing to remember about this organism, it, is, it, it can cause severe infections in children who have iron overload states, such as thalassemia and hemolytic anemia. So a couple of really important associations here that you should keep in mind. <clears throat>
All right, switching over to viruses. Which of the following is a true statement regarding rotavirus infection? Most symptomatic illness occurs in school-aged children. Fomites play an important role in transmission. Zoonotic spread is a common source of infection. Infection is almost always leads to symptomatic illness, or vomiting is a rare manifestation. Okay, so fomites play an important role, right. So fecal oral spread is the most common way that children get rotavirus. Fomites play a, a very important role in transmission. You just need to remember inpatient hospital playrooms where rotavirus can certainly hang out. And uh, when we used to see a lot of rotavirus in the hospital, the playroom was uh, probably a common place where children picked this up. Zoonotic spread is actually pretty uncommon. We used to see this commonly in the winter and spring before we started vaccinated against rotavirus. Asymptomatic infections are common. Uh, most symptomatic children uh, are between four and 24 months of age, so, so most children are actually infected early in life, and nearly all children used to be infected by three years of age. This is all prior to the rotavirus vaccine. And this used to be common in child care center outbreaks and in nosocomial infections. The incubation period is, is short. Vomiting is very common. These kids usually have watery diarrhea, but about 10% will actually have bloody stools. Uh, fever the first couple of days is not unusual. And rotavirus has been associated with extraintestinal manifestations like otitis media. Rotavirus vaccines, as you know, there are two vaccines licensed. One is a pentavalent vaccine and one is a monovalent vaccine. This is routinely recommended for all infants. We like to give the first dose between six weeks and 14 weeks, six days. Uh, the minimum interval between doses is four weeks and you wanna complete all doses by the age of eight months. This has been highly effective in preventing severe rotaviral gastroenteritis and uh, about 74% effective against any rotaviral gastroenteritis. Uh, there is a very slight risk of intussusception after the first dose, uh, but this has been amazingly successful and I don't remember the last hospitalized child that we've seen who's had rotavirus, whereas uh, the whole ward used to be filled with children who had rotavirus. These are other viruses that you should be familiar, especially the norovirus, Khaleesi virus, which is now the, the leading cause of gastroenteritis in the United States, okay? So today, if they're gonna ask you a question about viral gastro, it's usually gonna be norovirus, okay? These are spread to food and waterborne, outbreaks in childcare settings, these are the viruses that commonly cause outbreaks on cruise ships. Person-to-person -person spread is very common. Uh, the incubation period is very short, usually less than 24 hours. Astroviruses and in the enteric adenovirus I, ha I have listed here for completeness. Okay, so the next question is a four-year-old girl who has had chronic diarrhea, weight loss, and intermittent abdominal pain for the past six months. Stool screening tests for ONP have revealed Giardia infection on multiple occasions. What test is most likely to be abnormal in this child? Is it a serum CH50, an IgG, an IgM, an NBT, or an IgE? This one is tricky. I know Dr. Melton sitting back there is gonna cover some of these immune deficiencies. <clears throat> but which one is most associated with Giardia? All right, as I suspected, this would be tough. So the right answer is B, IgG. Okay, so let's talk about Giardia. So the water sources and person-to-person -person contact is how this is spread. Low inoculum needed to, to cause infection, so, so this is common in childcare settings. About 20% of children may actually carry this organism, but they are asymptomatic. This can cause watery diarrhea, but commonly causes chronic diarrhea, failure to thrive, and malabsorption. 
And remember that children who have hypogamma globulinemia, IgA deficiency, and HIV have a very difficult time with this organism. So going back to this, hypogamma globulinemia is most associated. CH50 complement deficient kids usually don't have a problem with this bug. IgM usually is not a problem. NBT is for chronic granulomatous disease. And these kids do not have abnormal IgEs. The way you make the diagnosis is by seeing the, the trophozoites or cysts in the stool via direct microscopy. Today we commonly use immunofluorescent or enzyme immunoassay techniques to, to, to detect these. Uh, these are fairly sensitive. We don't do string tests from duodenal aspirates anymore, but these are sensitive. The gold standard is obviously a duodenal biopsy, which we very rarely do. These are what these critters look like. And the drug of choice for treating this is metronidazole, about 80 to 95% cure rate with a five to seven day course. Uh, you can also use nitazoxanide, which also treats cryptosporidium. Alternatives I've got listed there, but pretty much today we use metronidazole as the drug of choice. Recurrences occur in about 10 to 20% of children, and most will respond to a second course of metronidazole. Immunocompromised patients may need prolonged or repeated courses of therapy. We generally don't like to treat asymptomatic children. We don't go looking for this organism if we don't have to. Um, and children attending childcare, we, we only exclude till they're asymptomatic. You don't need to exclude carriers or culture asymptomatic individuals. Cryptosporidium is another protozoa that causes diarrhea. Uh, this, uh, the, the primary hosts here are usually mammals, birds, and reptiles. And this organism is associated with waterborne outbreaks. The organism has been known to contaminate municipal water supplies. Several years ago, the city of Milwaukee had their whole water supply contaminated with crypto. This is a very difficult organism to clear from the water supply. This is important in childcare centers and person-to-person -person transmission is common. The highest incidence tends to be in the summer and early fall. This organism has been also transmitted through petting zoos, uh, as well as, again, person-to-person -person transmission and contaminated water. And the reason this is a difficult bug to get rid of is because it is resistant to chlorine. Uh, you really need a, a, a very good water filtration system to get rid of this organism. Children with normal immune system usually do not have a difficult time with this organism. They usually do very well. However, immunocompromised hosts, especially HIV-infected children, have a very difficult time clearing this organism. Many children are asymptomatic, usually causes a non-bloody watery diarrhea, vomiting, weight loss. Uh, this is, again, usually self-limited in normal hosts but in immunocompromised host, chronic severe diarrhea and biliary tract disease is common. We do have rapid immunofluorescent antibody tests to screen for this bug. Shedding may be intermittent, uh, and this is what the fluorescent antibody tests look like for this bug. There's really only one effective treatment, and it's not always totally effective. It's, it's nitazoxanide. We usually use for three days, uh, and the prevention here is the key. In you know, whenever you actually have a waterborne outbreak, you need to boil the water. Uh, filtration devices are usually needed. You want to av avoid public swimming pools if you're having diarrhea, obviously, uh, and avoid recreational water for two weeks after symptoms resolve. And to me, histolytica, the only time you're going to see this on a test is in a child who has developed a liver abscess, usually following a travel history or a child from an endemic area. Uh, so they may present to you a child who has mild diarrhea uh, and then develops right upper quadrant abdominal pain and fever and has a liver abscess. This is going to be usually the bug that they're looking for. 
Uh, we make the diagnosis by testing the stool for intestinal disease, but to make the diagnosis of, of an entamoeba liver abscess is through serology. Asymptomatic disease is very common uh, in the de developing world. We usually don't treat these kids, uh, but to treat colonic disease, you would have to use an intraluminal agent such as iodoquinol or paramomycin, and liver abscesses are treated with metronidazole followed by an intraluminal agent. Okay. So we're going to move on to skin, soft tissue, bone, and joint infections. And we'll start with a question. A two-year-old, previously healthy boy, develops redness and swelling of his right eye. There's no history of trauma. He's alert, not toxic, and febrile. And I want to know what the most appropriate antibiotic regimen for this child would be. Ampicillin, cefazolin, nafcillin, and gentamicin, trimethoprim sulfa, or ceftriaxone and clindamycin. Okay, ceftriaxone and clindamycin. All right, so this is, it could be periorbital cellulitis or orbital cellulitis. I don't give you a lot of info to differentiate those, but the organisms are, are really going to be the same. Without trauma, it's less likely to be caused by Staph aureus, but certainly you'd worry ab about an orbital process or bacteremic spread. So you want to cover for strep pneumo, for group A strep, maybe for Hib, and then for Staph aureus, including MRSA. So the choice of ceftriaxone and clindamycin would best be for that. So the causes of other skin conditions, so certainly impetigo, we worry about Staph aureus and group A strep, erysipelas, group A strep, non-facial cellulitis, group A strep, and staph. So human bites, you worry about anaerobic streptococci, Staph aureus, and Echinella corrodens is a common organism with a human bite. Anytime you have a wound that is contaminated by water, you worry about Pseudomonas and Aeromonas. For a surgical wound, Staph aureus and Group A strep. For a wound following a burn, we worry about Pseudomonas and Staph aureus. And then finally, Ecthyma gangrenosum, which is the rash we see in neutropenic patients, we worry about Pseudomonas. So let's just sp spend a few minutes talking about community-associated MRSA infections, which are common. These generally cause purulent skin and soft tissue infection. Boils are most common, uh, and some skin abscesses are locally invasive, which I'm sure you've seen. These can be progressive necrotizing lesions. They may require surgical debridement and hospitalization, and they may be confused with spider bites. Uh, sepsis is really atypical. This is what some of these local abscesses look like. MRSA can also cause severe pneumonia and empyema, cavitary pneumonias. Usually these follow influenza. Uh, they can rarely cause osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, sepsis, bacteremia, and toxic-like, toxic shock-like syndrome. Community-associated MRSA remains susceptible to many non-beta-lactam antibiotics, such as Bactrim and clindamycin and the tetracyclines. You need to be familiar with something called inducible clindamycin resistance uh, because uh, they can, uh, because you may have to actually interpret susceptibility testing, which we'll go over. So because clindamycin and erythromycin work by the same mechanism, there is a laboratory phenomenon where if a strain is resistant to erythromycin, the lab may report out that it's clindamycin susceptible but there may be what is called inducible resistance to clindamycin, which I'll review. So these are just to show you the difference between community-associated MRSA and hospital-acquired MRSA. The community-associated ones tend to be susceptible to Bactrim and clindamycin, whereas hospital-acquired ones, clindamycin especially, are not. So the D-test, I would just be familiar with just in case this is on the primary board exam. So this is just a simple lab test which detects inducible clindamycin resistance. 
Some labs will do this automatically without you having to tell them to do this, but some labs will not. The rate of these inducible clindamycin resistant varies depending on where you live. And this is what a positive D-test. This is the erythromycin disc. This is the clindamycin disc. So whenever you see this D, it means that there's inducible resistance to clindamycin. So what does that mean? Well, if you, if you actually have a bug that the lab reports as being erythrosusceptible and clindasusceptible, that is not a problem. Then you presume the bug to be clindasusceptible. If the lab tells you it's erythro-resistant and clindamycin-resistant, then it's resistant. Where you have to be careful is if the lab reports erythromycin-resistant but clindasusceptible, then they must do a D-test to tell you whether there's inducible resistance. If the D-test is negative, then there's no inducible resistance and clinda is susceptible. If it's a positive test, then clinda is resistant, and you probably shouldn't be using clinda to treat that patient, okay? Management principles for MRSA abscesses. Drainage is really important and careful follow-up. Uh, there are many studies that show that children, even if you give them the wrong antibiotic, if you drain the abscess, they are very, very likely to do well. So drainage is much more important than antibiotics. Um, other important things, you really want to try to op obtain a specimen for culture. Drainage again, wound care, very important follow-up and just know your local trends in susceptibility patterns. So for minor skin infections like impetigo, secondarily infected eczema, ulcers, lacerations, topical treatment with mupiracin is likely to be effective. Uh, the indications for antimicrobial therapy after incision and drainage, certainly if you have someone with severe or extensive disease, comorbidities, extremes of age, abscess that is not drained completely, associated septic phlebitis or lack of response, then you want to treat them with antibiotics. What you use empirically really depends. It's very, very difficult to make general recommendations in these cases, uh, but you certainly want to think about covering MSSA and MRSA depending on the clinical scenario. I've included just some empiric recommendations here that I'm not gonna go over for the sake of time, but th these are all in your handout, the drugs of choice for all these different scenarios. This is much more likely to be helpful to you clinically than on your board exam, because again, it's very difficult to generalize here about what you treat these kids with. All right, so let's move on to osteomyelitis. So uh, there are, uh, different routes that children get osteomyelitis. Hematogenous spread, however, is by far the most common route of a child getting osteomyelitis, uh, but they can also get this through direct inoculation following trauma or surgery, and then rarely following local invasion like from a cellulitis. So we're gonna focus mainly on hematogenous osteo. Fever is usually present, but about 20% of the time is not. And these kids usually present with limitation of an involved area or a limp. They may have localized swelling, warmth, erysema, or pain. Neonates are a little bit different because their osteo is usually gonna be accompanied by septic arthritis, and that is because the uh, epiphyseal, metaphyseal junction is within the joint capsule. So whenever they actually get a bone infection, it's very likely to spill over into the joint and babies usually present with pseudoparalysis. So puncture wound osteo is, is, is different. Uh, the classic history there is a child who steps on a nail through a tennis shoe, which punctures the tennis shoe and the dorsum of the foot. And the most common organism there that causes puncture wound osteo is pseudomonas. And these kids generally do not have fever or systemic signs of infection. What's the most common etiologic agent causing acute osteo in a healthy two-year-old child? Group A strep, Hib, pneumococcus, Staph aureus, or Salmonella? 
Great. So this is Staph aureus. These are the you know, common agents at different ages. Neonates, Staph aureus. You also have to think of group B strep as well as E. coli. And I put Candida there. This is for the micropremi who's been in the NICU for a while. So you've got infants and older children, Staph aureus. And pretty much Staph aureus is most common at all ages. You, you also think uh, about group A strep as well. Remember the sickler, Salmonella is very common. And then, you know, if, if you see a kid who has serratia or aspergillus, you always want to think of CGD. And that is a very, very common board question. CGD, serratia, staph aureus, aspergillus. Laboratory findings with osteo, sed rate, CRP are usually elevated. The blood culture is positive about 50% of the time. And if you aspirate the bone before antibiotics, usually going to get a positive bug 80% of the time. Remember that plain films do not become positive for 10 to 20 days, uh, so acutely they may not be helpful. Uh, MRI is the most sensitive and specific test to detect hematogenous osteo, and it is especially helpful for pelvic and vertebral osteo. We very rarely do bone scans anymore, uh, but when you suspect multiple foci is really the only time that we would think about doing a bone scan today. And then bone biopsy and culture are definitive. How we treat these, remember that prolonged antib antibiotic therapy is usually needed, usually anywhere between four to eight weeks for hematogenous osteo. Puncture wound osteo almost always needs to be debrided surgically. Uh, and uh, whenever you can drain purulent material, abscesses, remove necrotic bone, that is always helpful. And what we generally do is we usually start with IV treatment, and once there's been a clear response, we, quick, we quickly transition them to oral therapy, which is pretty straightforward, especially if you have a bug, as long as you have a reliable family and you can assure follow-up. This is a long question. Previously healthy 18-month-old brought to the ED for 10-hour history of fever, irritability, refusal to walk. He's febrile, irritable, and his right hip is held in a flexed, externally rotated, and abducted position, and he's not letting you move it. Um, they aspirated the joint and found 80,000 white cells, mostly polys. The gram stain has a lot of polys, but no organisms. So what's the test that is most likely to establish the diagnosis? That a CRP, a blood culture, a joint aspirate culture, an ANA and rheumatoid factor, or an ASO titer. <coughs> okay, very good. So a joint aspirate culture. This is septic arthritis or pyogenic arthritis. Synovial fluid is very helpful. The cell count, glucose, may be nonspecific. About 60% of the time, you're actually going to get a positive culture from the synovial fluid. So that's the best diagnostic test that we have. Remember that with GC, which we see in adolescents, it's much less common to get a positive culture. The blood culture is always worthwhile getting because 30 to 40% of the time, it will be positive as well. If you suspect GC, you also want to do general tract cultures. Plain radiographs are nonspecific. Ultrasound is helpful to show you if there's fluid in the joint space, and you always want to think about doing an, an MRI if you suspect osteomyelitis. Again, these are the bugs. Neonates, again, Staph aureus and group B strep. In older infants, Staph aureus. Strep pneumo, and I also include Kingella here because this is coming up as a relatively common cause of septic arthritis in young infants and toddlers, especially if they have a concomitant URI symptoms and, and they are in daycare. In older children and adolescents, you always also want to think about GC. These are the synovial fluid characteristics. Again, a lot of overlap between pyogenic arthritis and rheumatic diseases. You never want to rely on these fluid characteristics to make a definitive diagnosis. We treat septic arthritis similar to the way we treat osteomyelitis. We, we start with IV. 
and we quickly transitioned to orals. With gonococcal septic arthritis, they need seven to 10 days of ceftriaxone as long as they don't have meningitis and endocarditis. And you always want to think about hips, always need to be surgically drained. Uh, you always want to remove foreign material if you can, and you always want to consider surgical drainage when they don't respond to antibiotics. Okay, so we're just going to do a couple of really important fungal infections which will definitely, they will definitely ask you about, and because you may not be familiar with these. So which of the following is true regarding histoplasma capsulatum infection? The fungus is endemic to the southeastern coastline, Acute disseminated disease manifested by high fever, hepatosplenegaly, and pan pancytopenia is a feature of infection in infants. 10% of infected individuals are asymptomatic, or serologic techniques are rarely helpful in making the diagnosis. <clears throat> okay, very good. So the, the right answer is B. Um, so just, just a couple important things about histo. If, if they're going to give you a case of histo, they're usually going to give you a geographic location. They're, they're going to be clear that the child has recently been somewhere along the Ohio and Mississippi River valleys. They're going to give you an exposure to bat or bird dropping or caves. Okay, they've got to give you that because uh, that's going to be the clue. Most of these uh, in most of these infections are asymptomatic. They may have an acute influenza-like illness. They may have skin manifestations, migratory arthritis with more severe disease. And in very young children, this has been associated with an acute disseminated infection with fever, hepatosplenomegaly, pancytopenia. Ser serology is actually very helpful in making the diagnosis. Uh, and we usually like to try to culture the organism from the blood and the bone marrow. And they're not going to ask you how to treat this infection. They just want you to recognize that this is histo. All right, a three-year-old Filipino girl living in Arizona presents with a three-week history of headaches, increasing confusion, and fever. Her past medical history is not remarkable. And her spinal fluid shows 52 lymphocytes protein of 90 and a glucose of 35. So what's the organism most likely with this picture? Is it coxy, candida, crypto, aspergillus, or blastomyces? Again, a lot of epidemiologic clues here, okay? So the location and the fact that she has meningitis is also a clue. <clears throat> All right, so this is a classic case of coxy meningitis. This is endemic in the southwestern area, the San Joaquin Valley, as well as northern Mexico. Uh, there are certain high-risk groups that are much more likely to have disseminated disease and meningitis. And these include neonates, pregnant women, immunocompromised hosts, African Americans, Filipinos, and Hispanics. Asymptomatic infection is most common but again, these children can present with acute influenza-like illness, and really, without having the geography, you can't distinguish histo from coxy from blasto, okay? These kids also can have bone, skin, and soft tissue manifestations. You need to be familiar with, with, with coxy meningitis. Uh, this, this is usually a subacute or chronic meningitis. Uh, with fever, chronic headache, and confusion. There is usually less than 500 whites. They're all going to be mononuclear cells with a low glucose and a high protein. <clears throat> Hypersensitivity manifestations are common, and you make the diagnosis through serology. I doubt that they're going to ask you how to treat these, but uh, Amphob and fluconazole are very effective against this infection. This is erythema nodosum, which, which is associated. So, so histo and coxy are known as dimorphic pathogenic fungi. Blasto is also included there, uh, sporothrix as well. These generally tend to cause localized and disseminated disease, mainly in normal hosts. So, so these will be normal, healthy children that they present. 
unlike opportunistic fungi, which will never be normal healthy children. So children who get candida are usually going to be preemies, central venous catheters. Kids who get cryptococcus are almost always going to have HIV, and this causes a subacute and chronic meningitis. Kids with aspergillus are going to be neutropenic or on lots of corticosteroid therapy. And then finally, the association between diabetic ketoacidosis and mucor mycosis. Okay, so these are not going to be normal, healthy children. And finally, and we don't need to do audience response here, these are important parasites which I've listed here. You just need to know a little bit about each of these. And what you need to know, I have in these slides. So which one of these causes rectal prolapse and dysentery? Just shout it out. <clears throat> Okay, Trichuris trichuria, or whipworm, very good. Which one causes an iron deficiency anemia? Silence. Yeah, it's A, Necator americanus, and we'll uh, talk a little bit about these. Which one is a toddler with wheezing, eosinophilia, and hypergammaglobulinemia? This, can, this one's tricky because it can be a couple of them, but is most likely to be visceral larva migrans, which is Toxicara canis. Acute intestinal obstruction. Ascaris, very good. Which one? Fever, myalgias, periorbital edema, and conjunctival hemorrhage. So this is going to be trichinosis or trichinella spiralis. So just real quickly, whipworm, this is Trichuris trichuria. It can cause dysentery, it can mimic IBD, uh, and it can cause growth retardation, but, but it, is, it is associated with rectal prolapse. Hookworm, or Necator americanus, which, which is a roundworm, uh, this is known to cause a hypochromic microcytic anemia, and that's what I would remember about this. This is the ground itch uh, that you may see at first. This is what it looks like. Visceral larva migrans is the dog tapeworm or uh, Ascaris worm, which is Toxicara. This is almost going to be, they're going to give you a classic history of a toddler with a history of pica who develops wheezing and has eosinophilia hypergammaglobulinemia. This is different from ocular larva migrans, and the way that you make this diagnosis is through serology and not by looking at the stool, because the worms do not go back into the intestines. They, they in, you know, invade the liver and the lung, and they will present with a pneumonitis. So this is always going to be a toddler who's with a history of pica. Ascaris is roundworm. Uh, and this can certainly cause acute intestinal obstruction. It's also associated, uh, associated with Leffler syndrome, which is an eosinic pneumonitis. Uh, these are usually going to be older kids, uh, and that's how you're going to distinguish these from visceral larva migrans. Trichinosis, uh, these kids, um, you, they're going to give you a history of eating raw or undercooked pork. Uh, and. Uh, the bilateral periorbital edema and subungual hemorrhages are going to be clues here. And that's it. So we're only a couple of minutes behind. Whew. All right.